you started the website because of your own experience of sexual assault, and you've yes. talked about that, 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 that a lot over the years. Um, did you start it because you wanted to change the world? I had no idea when I started it that, that it would be doing anything beyond perhaps 30 or 40 people might see it. Um, so no, I didn't set out to change the world. I didn't feel actually that I could tackle the problem, but every time I tried to talk about it, people told me insistently that it didn't exist. And I thought maybe I can't fix sexism, but what if I could get people to see it? And that was the idea that if you hear enough people's stories side by side, it becomes much harder to dismiss them as overreacting, making a fuss about nothing. He meant it as a compliment compliment, you've got the wrong end of the stick, you brought that on yourself. All the reasons women have been told for so long, don't make a fuss, don't talk about this. So I thought perhaps if we brought, I don't, at the time, maybe 50 women's stories together, I'd have something to point to, to say, look, this does really exist. But this happened at the same time as social media was exploding. In it did, as well. and exploded in a way I'd never anticipated because of that. And so the hashtag, did, well, did that become more important than the website? I don't think so. The hashtag is important and it has enabled this to crop up in the social media feeds and timelines of people who don't go looking for it. And in that way, I think it's really powerful. We hear from lots of men who say, you know, a friend who I love or someone who I care about retweeted this experience of a woman and it really jarred me because it's a woman's daily life, not necessarily in the UK, but perhaps a woman in Argentina or Peru and she's harassed in the street horribly, made to feel afraid. And suddenly that visceral moment crops up in the front of the screen of a man who's working, perhaps sitting on, behind a desk in London or in India. So it forces it on people, and in that sense, the hashtag was important. But the website also had huge importance because it created a space where women's stories, where people's stories, and we didn't just hear from women, but in particular where women and girls' stories could be heard, often for the first time, and believed without rebuttal, without dismissal, without disbelief. And we know that the cathartic effect of simply being given a space to tell your story has a huge impact in itself because we've heard from so many people who've said that after seeing their story alongside those of so many others, after feeling that they weren't alone, after realising for the first time that it wasn't their fault, they felt able to go on and report something, to report a rape to the police, to report discrimination in their workplace. So we know that, that the website itself can be very powerful as well. Do you think over the last few years the world has changed? Have men become less sexist? Is there less sexual assault? I think that it's a very difficult thing to quantify and I think it's dangerous to suggest that the problem is necessarily shifting that quickly, but I think what we can say with confidence is that the conversation has changed. We are talking about this now. It has immense prominence in the public conversation. People are starting to acknowledge that the problem exists and that's a strong position from which to go forward and try and solve it. But I don't think that we're there yet. I mean, why not? When you think about it, I mean, you know, we've been talking about this not, not just for the last few years, but for decades. We have. This is what feminism has been about. Well, of course, and I don't think it's a failure of feminism and of the decades of women in all walks of life who've worked so hard that, that this hasn't yet changed, because, of course, we have had great wins, great strides towards everything from equal pay to the right to work without experiencing maternity discrimination to the right to um, abortion and reproductive health care. But we still live in a country where 85,000 women are raped every year and 400,000 sexually assaulted, where over two women every week are killed by a current or former partner, where around a third of teenage girls experience sexual assault at school. So this is a huge problem. We still live in a country where 54,000 women a year lose their jobs to maternity discrimination, even though the law has changed, culture and attitudes haven't yet caught up. And, and that's a very slow shift. It so, does take time. I mean, is this, I mean, this is sometimes described as, you know, is this, is this the last barricade of feminism you know is this the last struggle that you've got to beat uh, you know sexual violence and sexual um, assault um, and then and then you kind of cracked it as feminists well no I mean it's not a single struggle by any means both within the feminist movement itself and further afield you know even within the feminist movement sexual violence is not this sole remaining problem that we face everything from women's underrepresentation in politics to the way in which women are portrayed in the media to the treatment of young girls in terms of the role models that are offered to them and the options that they're given in life to the parental leave that forces men not to spend time with their young families to 
to the intersecting forms of inequality that affect so many women as well, women who write to us with experiences of sexism who are also experiencing racism, Islamophobia, homophobia. And if you look at their stories, their lived experiences on the project website, you immediately see that those aren't separate problems because the way these women live them, it's a disabled woman being told to do a pole dance around her walking stick. It's entwined. It's a black woman in a job interview where a white woman went in before her and had a completely normal interview. But with her, the interviewer starts talking about his fantasies of sleeping with what he describes to her as spicy and exotic black women. It's the fact that one in four women in this country experience domestic violence, but that number goes up to one in two for disabled women. It's so clear that, that this is a problem on so many different fronts. So no, I don't think that we can yet say we're just at the last final hurdle. So what, why do you, what do you think distinguishes your wave of feminism from what's gone before? Well, partly I think there's an artificiality about the way in which people try to kind of silo off and separate these waves of feminism. I always think it must be incredibly um, disempowering and frustrating for those women who've worked at the coalface throughout for the media to present you're this finished. idea. Yeah, that, yes, yeah. Well, exactly, you know, your thing's <laughs> done. And it, it also suggests, well, they failed and what will come next? And in reality, we are constantly moving forward, buoyed and pushed by all these women who've come before us. And of course, there are women who are on the front line who are working in rape crisis centres and abuse shelters or lobbying the government behind closed doors desperately trying to change the law who aren't necessarily being picked up and portrayed in the newspapers as the leaders of a new wave of feminism. In particular, we know women of colour, disabled women. You know, it's very specific who the media chooses to pick up and say, hey, look, there's a new wave of exciting feminist activists. The reality, I think, for me, is that there are so many women and, and men as well working on the front line of this movement constantly. Um, but I do think that perhaps digital media has made a big difference, social media, the internet, that this wave has been buoyed and helped by the fact that suddenly we can connect with our sisters in different countries, we can support one another across borders and boundaries. A really good example recently, I think, is when the Chinese, the so-called Feminist Five activists, were arrested and imprisoned in China simply for handing out stickers against sexual harassment. And other women around the world raised such an outcry that it helped to put enormous pressure to eventually have them released. So we're able to support one another and to find one another in the way that we weren't before. We hear from a lot of young girls at school who have become activated and fascinated and drawn in and supported by feminist activism online in a way that I think during my youth, that kind of support and awareness just wasn't available. So it was much more easy to become isolated. Because, I mean, if, if, there were, if the, the two big issues of the moment are broadly social justice, mm -hmm. so, you know, equality in, in, in the workplace and equal pay and those sorts of issues, and sexual assault and violence and women's right to exist without being assaulted. Do you, do you think just talking about these two things more, the way websites like yours mm -hmm. have, have facilitated, um, you know, gets you there? I think it's a very, very important first step, but of course it's not the only solution on its own. There are limitations to the internet, to who has access to the internet, to whether you're talking into an echo chamber. I think it does have enormous positives. A really good example of this is the fact that many women are experiencing things every day that they have no idea are actually illegal, that they would have the right to complain about if they wanted to. When I go and talk to girls, young women at university and girls at school, and I talk to them about experiences, and if I were to use the term sexual assault, a large number of them wouldn't necessarily relate to that. But when I start talking talking to them about somebody putting a hand between their legs when they're walking down the street, somebody stroking their thighs when they're sitting on the bus, pushing up behind them with an erection in a crowded tube carriage, groping their breasts when they're not interested, grabbing their bum in a club, putting a hand where they don't want it to when they're out for a run or even in the school corridor. Almost every girl in every room I speak to identifies with that experience. Now, oh, that age? experience... So yesterday, for example, I talked to 113-year-old girls and every one of them put their hand up that they'd have some kind of experience of sexual harassment. And yet, they wouldn't use the term sexual assault to describe those physical experiences. So there's a gulf between the reality of what women are protected from by law and a society in which they're told, don't make a fuss, this is normal, this is what you should expect, you are bringing it on yourself. So talking about it for that reason is immensely powerful because it helps to open up that awareness of people's rights and about the reality of what's going on. And it helps to let men know what's going on if they're not aware of it. And of course, the vast majority of men would never dream of behaving in this way themselves, but they also 
also, many of them don't experience it themselves. So we've got this huge critical mass of men who just don't know this is happening because the very fact that they wouldn't do it themselves means that they have no idea it's going on. And talking about it is so important because we need those men to be part of changing things. So when you go into schools, are you talking to girls on their own or are you talking to them with boys? Oh, absolutely, with boys as well, as much as possible. Sometimes we'll have workshop groups where we talk to people separately, but I think it's just as important to be talking to boys, if not more so, really, at that age, as it is with girls. And how are the them. boys reacting? There's a really wide variety of responses. Um, I think it really depends on the age of the boys I speak to. Up until the age of about 12, boys are as shocked about this stuff as girls are. They're really interested and engaged, and they, they find it odd that this is going on. They want to help, they want to be involved. Then you hit a point at about perhaps 13 or 14 where suddenly something starts to creep in from outside. And I think there is um, a, an extremism online, a radicalization of young men, very deliberate, very targeted, very wrapped up in white nationalism and extremism of other kinds that is going on, particularly around racism as well, but that targets young boys online. And so you go into schools and you'll get 14 and 15 year old boys repeating often the same things back to you that you've heard at other schools. Things about women lying about rape, about the statistics being lies, um, about women asking for it if they're wearing for a short skirt. And they have been taught and indoctrinated to think that feminism is about hating men, it's about women taking over the world and that it's something that they should resist. But having but a conversation they... often opens up and, and really helps to undermine those ideas. I mean, when you're saying, you, say you're hearing these lines everywhere, yes. I mean, at, at what proportion? Would you say? In terms of how many boys? Yeah. Oh, still the minority. Definitely still the minority. But it, it comes up in a lot of the places I go. And I think we have to be prepared to grapple with the fact that there is an extremely powerful network online that is specifically targeting men and trying to recruit them to this cause of misogyny and anti-feminism. And looking at the incel movement is a good example of that. And the fact that we're seeing that spill offline now with so many mass attacks, terror attacks, I would say, being perpetrated in the name of the incel movement. So who is behind this online? Well, that's a really difficult question to answer. We're talking about big websites, about message boards, about threads across various different forums, including places like 4chan and Reddit, but also websites specifically set up with the aim of encouraging this. They're often behind kind of mass attacks on women who speak out online. So sometimes if I go home and I'll have 200 messages from men telling me what knives they'll use to disembowel me with and what time they're planning to rape me and how they'll videotape raping me and put it online, it will be because someone on one of these websites has said, let's shut this woman down. And the way that we'll do it is that we will all send her these messages all at once. It's, it's orchestrated and targeted. And so often when we talk about it, people say, oh, well, you know, this is just a, a sad teenage boy in his mum's basement. Well, in my experience, that is extremely, extremely insulting to teenage boys, but it also underestimates the scale of the problem. But how, how alarming... I mean, just to talk about that as an example for a second. Um... How, how alarming is it if you know that that's what's happening? If you know that this is organised and mm -hmm. this is just a bunch of whoever they are, mm -hmm. they're probably not just teenage boys, they're, they're probably all sorts of age groups, um, does it make it easier to write off and say, well, they're just, they're just crazies? They don't yeah. represent the male population in any way. Well, no, I think that's the problem. The problem is that it is very deliberately being targeted as a very... Um, uh, seductive ideology is being targeted at men who are for various reasons themselves experiencing various problems in their lives, things that they perceive as gross inequalities, often ironically because of sexism themselves and it's seen as a way out that, that hating women and blaming these things on women and seeing feminism as this terrifying threat to men something that wants to take things away from men is a very attractive way to kind of channel that feeling of injustice I think for me, to answer the question of whether it's worrying, it wouldn't be worrying if we were having a wider conversation that offers rebuttal. If we were having a wider conversation that offers these teenage boys the opportunity to talk about healthy relationships, for example, and what they look like, or about sexual consent. But in the absence of that wider conversation, and at the moment that wider conversation is largely absent, then it becomes more worrying because, of course, it becomes more influential. And how do you think it's actually happening? I mean, if, you, if you're in and out of schools and you're mm -hmm. talking to boys and girls, wh why does this change happen around that time? I mean, these are all, mm. not all, but largely boys who will have been brought up with a mum who they love, mm. um, who they will cuddle and, um, you know, and have a loving relationship with. So what happens? 
between them being those little boys and them turning into these teenage sexual harassers in your well, mind? I think that there's something about the normalisation that makes it possible to live in a world in which you love your mum, but you also walk down the street and see how normal it is for somebody to be shouting about a woman's breasts in the street because it's presented as normal. You don't necessarily think of it as something extreme, as something particularly shocking to engage in. And but do you think it is normal? I think it's normalised in our society, certainly. When I was sexually assaulted on a bus, I said out loud what was happening because I was on the phone to my mum. So I was in that bubble where I didn't really feel like I was in public. And I said quite loudly, I'm on the bus. This man just groped me. And it was a single decker bus and everybody on that bus heard and everybody looked out the window. There must have been perhaps 20 people on there and no one even made eye contact with me. But are you saying you think they looked out the window because they thought it was normal and nothing to make a fuss of or because they thought that you were crazy and, you know, making something up or, or what? Well, I think that either reaction suggests that we don't support people who are experiencing these things in our society, that we don't take violence against women seriously, um, that groping and, and that term for it normalises and euphemises what is actually sexual violence. And in a way, I suppose that the motivation behind what they did isn't really the issue. It, it's the message it sent, not only to me at the time as a young woman, don't report this, don't make a fuss, don't talk about it, you keep this to yourself, but also to the man on the bus. You can get away with sexually assaulting a woman in public in this country, on public transport, and even if she says out loud what's happening, no one will do a thing to stop you. So what are you saying to the boys when you go in schools to try and change things? Well, I think the first thing is to talk to them about how broad this is, how much it encompasses that's relevant to them as well. The first thing is to try and unpick the message they've been sent, which is here are men's issues and here are women's issues and you have to pick a side. This is the battle of the sexes, it's gender wars, because so often that's what they've seen set up in media debates and that's what they've been told online. Online and you'll see a specific issue that it relates to men being held up as a kind of trump card for why we shouldn't make a fuss about feminism. The most obvious example is how dare you talk about women's rights and feminism when the male suicide rate is three times higher than it is for women. And so these boys have been taught and indoctrinated into thinking, if you want someone to care about you, then the people talking about feminism hate you. They're trying to drown out those issues. They don't care. Those issues are in direct opposition. So what I try to talk about is how very closely connected those problems are, that all the experts, all the evidence we have suggests that that tragically high male suicide rate stems partly from the fact that we bring up boys in a world that teaches them boys don't cry and it's not manly or okay to talk about your feelings and that that's a gender stereotype and that gender stereotypes don't exist in a vacuum they're two sides of a coin in this case the other side of that coin women are hysterical hormonal can't control their emotions we couldn't have a woman in the oval office if she was menopausal because you wouldn't want those hormones around the nuclear button and so the act of tackling that gender stereotype has massive positive impact for all of us. That those very arguments that they've been told are reasons against feminism are ironically actually some of the biggest arguments for exactly what feminists are fighting for. Do you, do you think some women, though, might also be guilty of this battle of the sexes polarisation? You know, that this is not just a male um, prism through which we're seeing the world. You know, it's sort of, it's, it's common for... Women say, well, you're a man, you would say that, all that kind of stuff. I think, of course, it's far more complex than a, a battle of the sexes. It's not all women think this and all women experience that, nor men on this side. It's really complex. We live in a world where these things impact us from such a young age that it's quite understandable and normal for women to internalise elements of, of misogyny. Um, it's also a world in which it's a common survival or coping mechanism for women to express misogyny as a means of survival within a very male-dominated culture. So, absolutely... A, and again, this is not about suggesting that this is something that all men have hardwired into their DNA. We really are talking about a very small minority of men making very deliberate choices. Right. OK, well, but then, well, then, you, then you sort of, draw, draw, you know, thrown up the sort of the nurture nature yep. bit. So let's just talk about that okay. for a moment. I mean, do you think men and women are, do you think, the, do you think sex makes you different? Or do you think more to do with, you know, it, it's a lot more to do with how you, how you are gendered, how you're raised? I think having looked at a lot of the research around this, I feel fairly confident that it is very extensively more nurture related than nature. I think if you look at the work of someone like Cordelia Fine and her delusions of gender, 
all of these studies about biological determinism, about brain difference, about men having better spatial awareness skills and women being more naturally compassionate, they've all been debunked. It really has been shown again and again and again that this is about what we're told from an incredibly young age is expected of us. I saw a picture the other day of two onesies that were newborn size and the boys one said, I'm super with a picture of a superhero and the girls was pink and said, I hate my thighs. It is literally babyhood is the time, the time at which we're told to start worrying about these issues. We know that girls are five when they start worrying about the size and shape of their bodies. We know that a quarter of seven-year-olds have dieted to lose weight. We know that parents, when they give their children pocket money, not only have a gender gap, give boys more than girls, but also withhold the girls' money and buy things for them, but allow boys to control their own finances from childhood. We know, for example, that when girls are given studies where they're given maths tests, the girls and the boys at a young age, around seven years old, perform equally. But when the girls are told girls aren't very good at math, boys are naturally better, their scores plummet. There is so much evidence to suggest that this is about nurture rather than nature. So are you, are you also telling the girls not to become women who also fall into those stereotypes of the way women think, the way men think, women multitasking, men being simplistic, all those sorts of things. You know, you're training them not to not to fall into those conversational traps. Well, I think it's not so much about trying to force them in any one direction or training them as blowing wide open the narrowness of the options that have been presented to them. So it's not about saying, you don't want to look after children, you don't want to be at home raising a family. It's about saying you have every choice available to you and you are suited to whatever it is that you feel you personally passionately but want I'm, to I'm, do. I'm, I'm trying to get you to say what you th how you think women should relate to men and how girls should relate to boys and where the responsibility for gender stereotypes lies there. Mm. Well, I think really when you're talking about children, it's about what we say to them. The responsibility lies with us as adults, as parents, as teachers interacting with them, but also with the media, with what the world around them presents to them. If you're a seven-year-old child and you excitedly run into the toy store with the pocket money that you've saved up and you see a chemistry set that looks brilliant and you run towards it and then suddenly you look up and it's under a big blue sign that says boys' toys, you don't necessarily have the analytical capacity at that point to say, well, that's an odd thing. But that doesn't you really just get the anymore. message, oh, it absolutely still does. You go into the big toy stores, go into the big Some of the big, big toy big stores have made changes, that, which is fantastic. That's not really the way it is. Go into one of our biggest supermarkets, even now, go in today, go in this evening. Their magazine sections are divided up into women's and men's. And under women's, you'll see celebrities, sure, diet Sure, that's and true, gossip. but not the chemistry sets And I under mean. men's, you'll see the new scientist. You'll see the economist, the National Geographic, the spectator. So actually, as a five-year-old going around in the trolley in the supermarket, you get the message, science, history, nature is literally labelled for men. And when you get to A-level, less than half of all state schools have any girls studying physics at all. Now, I'm not saying for one second that that is directly responsible for that, but I think it matters. I think we have to look at the context and, and weave a thread that joins some of these dots together. I think we're so often told, don't make a fuss about media sexism, but it's all right to talk about the underrepresentation of women in politics. How can we talk about the fact that fewer than a third of our MPs are women if we're not even allowed to discuss the fact that when our Prime Minister and the First Minister Minister have a massive meeting about Brexit. The front page of our single biggest selling daily newspaper says, never mind Brexit, who won legs it with a close up picture of their legs. Of course, those things are related. We have to be able to talk about all of this and, and recognise that it's complex, but it is interrelated. Well, in terms of sort of fixing those specific problems, mm -hmm. representation, number of MPs, you know, women in the boardroom, all that kind of thing. Um, what do you want to do about it beyond exhortation and telling people to be better? I think that the structure of the way in which we structure the workplace itself fundamentally needs to change. I think these are systemic problems and they can't be overcome by individual solutions. I think that the working hours and the working nature of Parliament, for example, is not in any way conducive to people with parenting obligations and that that largely still, because of the sex of society we live in, falls on women. I think we need to look at issues like flexible working hours and shared parental leave. I think that we're talking about big systemic solutions for problems that are affecting individuals individuals. A really good example of this, I think, is that we've been talking a lot about workplace sexual harassment recently, and there's been a lot of pressure on women to come forward. Why don't women just report it? Things would be better if they did. Recent studies have found that over half of all women experience workplace sexual harassment, and 80% don't report it. And it's very easy to look at that and go, that's the answer. Come on, women, support it. That's the trap we fall into. We look to individuals and victims to solve a systemic problem. But if you look 
beneath those statistics, you found that of the women who do report workplace sexual harassment at the moment, three quarters see no change and another 16% on top of that see things worsen or lose their job as a result. So if we don't change the system, we can't expect individuals to behave differently within it. And do you want to change the law to enable positive action? There are aspects of law that I think should change. Positive action wouldn't necessarily be my first focus. I'd look at things like um, Section 40 of the Equality Act, which puts a duty on employers to protect their employees from third-party harassment. At the moment, they don't have that duty anymore. It's been repealed to protect their employees from... So that's harassment from a client or a customer rather than a co-worker. But harassment isn't the reason women aren't being promoted necessarily, is it? So, I mean... Well, I think that of, these things are all of that, very closely connected and that's really important. Women who are being harassed because they don't feel able to report it often adapt co coping me mechanisms. They might lose a job because of it. They might leave a job. They might stop putting themselves forward. They might not volunteer for a promotion or a particular project if the man who's been harassing them is the person in charge of it. So these things are connected. But you don't actually. want all women shortlists and that kind of... Personally, I actually action. think that positive action can have a good impact. For a long time, I was really opposed to it because it seemed to me like it blamed women again. It says women need a leg up. They're not quite making it, so we need to give them a bit of help instead of recognising the systemic discrimination that's actually preventing them from achieving equally. And for me, if you do that without targeting the discrimination, then all you're doing is putting on a sticking plaster and more women won't follow behind them. But that's become a very unfashionable view, hasn't it? Well, and, I, and I wonder why. I personally have slightly changed my view. That was my original belief. The reason I've changed really since then is because every argument I hear against positive discrimination is absurd. The most common one you hear is but it really ought to be the right person for the job. The most important thing is that it's the right person for the job. The implication there is, at the moment, the right person gets the job and you're talking about giving women an unfair leg up. Well, just statistically, that's nonsense. It cannot be true that the right person is always getting the job in a world where there are three times more men named John running FTSE 100 companies than all the women put together. It doesn't add up that there would have happened to have been um, more men who happened to be at school with David Cameron and qualified to be in the cabinet than all the women in the country, you know, just statistically. That's ridiculous. We have to recognise that when we talk about positive discrimination, we're really talking about correction of an existing system of unofficial discrimination that's been going on for centuries. And as a short-term measure, I'm starting to think it might be necessary alongside other measures. When you look at something like the survey that came out of Harvard recently, showing that when they sent out science CVs across the country, identical but for the names, half of which were male and half of which were female, overwhelmingly the man got the job and was offered a higher starting salary. And when you realise that that level of unconscious bias is going on, suddenly you start to look at positive action and think maybe it's an unappealing but necessary short-term measure alongside other things because we're just not getting there fast enough otherwise. So you'd time limit it? You'd say for the next five years or the next Absolutely. ten years we're would, going to allow... I would time limit it and I would say that it has to be alongside really, really robust um, action to try and take those hurdles out of the way that are currently preventing the progress from being made so that you don't need positive action in the long run. And, and, and do you think um, that kind of action needs to be spread across other unrepresented groups? Absolutely. If you look at that Harvard survey, for example, there's very clear correlations with other studies that have been done with white-sounding and non-white-sounding names and extremely similar results coming out of them. Um, if you look at all of these issues that we've been talking about with representation, you realise again that they are completely intersectional. Um, and that's really clear if you look at any field. If you look at the 573 listed statues around the UK, only 15% of them are of women, but only two of them are of a named black woman. If you look at the enormous online abuse experienced by huge numbers of female MPs, you also learn that in the run-up to the last election, almost half of it alone was directed at Diane Abbott. So these are issues that are specifically affecting different groups and particularly intensely affecting people who live at the intersections of those groups. And how would you stop the reaction to that, which would be, well, you just got the job because you're a woman? Well, I think that part of it is that it would be very clear that women would be doing brilliant jobs because we know that at the moment we are enormously underrepresented in terms of the best people that should be there. The talent pool isn't massively skewed towards men, but the people in the roles are. It's my belief that women in those roles would perform in such a way that, that they would themselves be the answer to that question. Wouldn't happen everywhere, would it? It wouldn't. I mean, nothing is perfect. There is no single perfect solution and nobody wants positive action. There is no woman out there going, give us positive action. It's incredibly unappealing. Well, you are now. 
now. So, you know, <laughs> and that's really interesting. So I think it is something that I would grudgingly accept in some cases as an unappealing but perhaps necessary action alongside other things. But it's not my priority. It's not the main thing that I would be campaigning for and looking for. What is the main thing you're campaigning for? More than anything else, action in schools. More than anything else, sex and relationships education that talks to young people about their rights to their own body, about these simple concepts, the simplest of things, about what a healthy relationship looks like, about what sex is. Because at the moment, it's not on the curriculum. Nothing but the biology of sex is compulsory across all schools. And I go into schools every week and I hear from kids who are 13 or 14 who think that it's not rape if your boyfriend forces you to have sex because he's your boyfriend and a stranger in a shadowy dark alleyway is what a rapist looks like. We know that uh, young people are experiencing vast amounts of sexual violence in our schools. It's incredibly unappealing. People don't want to believe it. But we know from the statistics, we know that 80% of young people, 78%, are hearing slut and slag used towards girls at school repeatedly. We know that almost a third of 16 to 18-year-old girls has experienced unwanted sexual touching, in other words, sexual assault at school. We know that um, 5,500 sexual offences, including 600 rapes, were reported to UK police from in schools during a three-year period. In other words, if you work it out for the length of the school term, about a rape per day is being reported to UK police from inside schools. So we know that this is happening. We know that this is being experienced by students in our schools, and yet we're not having those basic conversations with them about healthy relationships and sexual consent and respectful behaviour towards other people. It's just mind-blowing, especially when you consider the extent to which they're influenced by online porn. And again, it's easy to think, oh, well, not my child or not most children, but we have the stats. We know that 60% of young people have seen it by the time they're 14. A quarter are seeing it at the age of 12. And we know that a lot of what they're seeing is really confusing. So you get a 14-year-old girl who writes to me saying, my name is Nicola and I'm so scared to have sex. I cry nearly every night because a boy showed me a video on a mobile phone at school and I didn't realise until then that when you have sex the woman has to be hurting and crying. And this comes up again and again. I went to a school recently where they'd had a rape case involving a 14-year-old boy and a teacher had said to him, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And he'd looked straight back at her and said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex. So when we know that those messages are out there and that they are reaching teenagers, and then we don't give them anything to offset that, we don't give them the opportunity to talk about it, it, it makes no sense. What should we do about those messages then? Well, for me, it's about offsetting them. It's about a conversation. You can't it's stop about them. the opportunity you think to it, talk the, about sort of them. The, the dam has burst and it's too late to do anything about porn. Pragmatically, if we're going to focus on something specifically, I think that offering young people a forum in which to discuss it is much more practical and realistic an approach than trying to shut it down, trying to stop it. I think that you run into all kinds of very complex issues around freedom of expression. I hope, and perhaps this is extremely naive and idealistic of me, but I don't think that the internet in itself is in any way good or evil. I don't think that necessarily particular mediums are good, good or evil. I think that the internet, what we see online and online porn currently, reflects the society that we live in and the misogyny of the society that we live in. I hope that if we change that, then those things change as well. Are you sure that people in authority, whether they're teachers or other people in society, are capable of teaching... Um, equality, if you like? <laughs> it's a good question. I've seen brilliant things that teachers are doing in schools. There are amazing schools doing brilliant work on this. At the moment, it's really patchy and they're just not but given the support that they need. You're situations right. as well, there and they're schools... riven with sexism. Yes. And... So there are schools and teachers who are part of the problem. Of course there are. That's why I think it's very important that we also have avenues for outside organisations to be involved in delivering some of this, that teacher training provides avenues for teachers to be given very specific training. It obviously doesn't work to click your fingers and say it's compulsory for everyone to learn about this and not to provide teachers with the training and schools with the funding and connect them up with outside organisations to deliver it in a way that's actually positive and beneficial, of course. What do you think of misogyny as a hate crime? I think it's been grossly and frustratingly distorted in the media. Ever since this was put forward, ever since this proposal happened, we've seen headlines about how outrageous it is that poor men, innocent men, are going to be arrested for a wolf whistle. And that is the prevailing opinion of what this is. The reality is completely different. What we're talking about is the way in which the police report and record crimes in their own databases. So the misogyny hate crime, what it would do, it wouldn't change the law. It wouldn't make anything a crime that does 
doesn't already exist as a crime. It wouldn't suddenly make wolf whistling illegal or comments in the street or anything else. It just means that pre-existing crimes that may be driven by misogyny would be recorded by local police forces as having to do with misogyny. And that has two effects. Firstly, it means that police are able to build up a picture of where a particular problem is going on and where it's a gendered problem, which we know exists, and then they can tackle it. But crucially, the other thing is, it lets women know that they have the right to report things, that they'll be taken seriously reporting things that previously they didn't even realise were a crime. There was a recent um, pilot project in Nottingham. Well, a recent pilot project in Nottingham where they did this, they made a big fanfare that they were going to be recording misogyny hate crime. And what women came forward to report were being followed down the street, uh, being indecently assaulted, being grabbed, being groped, being touched, in one case being kidnapped. So women didn't suddenly come forward in their hordes to say, someone will whistle at me, I want to go to the police, even though that's what's been suggested in the media. But why weren't they media. coming forward before? That's the shocking bit, Well, because of, I think, what I said earlier, that we live in a society in which this is completely normalised. When I talk to girls of perhaps 14 or 15, they will use the word normal to describe men rubbing up behind them in a packed tube carriage with an erection or stroking their legs whilst they're in their school uniform on the way to school. We've just seen a report just last week that showed that the vast majority of schoolgirls in the UK have experienced some form of sexual harassment and I think it showed that a third had experienced it whilst in their school uniform. Well, when something starts from that age, you get the message that it's normal. You're terrified to say anything. So many women who do say something are told it was your own fault. What were you wearing? What were you doing? Look at the way we treat women in the media when they do come forward. Look at the way in which the President of the United States is able to whip up a crowd into mocking and laughing at somebody who's come forward to describe an experience of sexual assault. In every area of our society, we send the message, this isn't something we take seriously. Don't report it. And, and so do you think those women who are arguing Me Too's gone far enough mm. um, are, are setting you back? Well, I think that they are a very small part of a much wider backlash. I think there can be a tendency to focus on women who are against feminism or, or who try to kind of prevent it because it's very easy then to make them the scapegoats. You know, women don't even want this themselves. Women can't decide what they want. Women are fighting amongst themselves. And it's very easy there to sort of slightly step away from the real issue, which is that our society um, is invested in maintaining the status quo and has a massive backlash against attempts towards progress. I think we've seen a massive massive kind of social panic about Me Too. We've seen uh, people without any sense of irony describing it as a witch hunt against men. Um, we've seen the suggestion that it means that due process will never be followed again and that women in their hordes want to whip up online mobs to get innocent men sacked just because they say something. I think it's really important to recognise that Me Too came out of sheer desperation that this was about women who had no other avenue, where procedures didn't exist, where policies had failed them, where due process hadn't provided justice, in desperation speaking out online. No woman wants to speak out in the public sphere about this abuse, because look at the way we treat the women who do. Christine Blasey Ford can't go home because she's receiving so many death threats. So the idea that this is something that women want and enjoy, something salacious, couldn't be further from the truth. And if you look at the fact that 12 million women use the Me Too hashtag to speak out about their experiences and that we've seen a handful of powerful men experience repercussions while those 12 million women largely haven't seen any kind of justice at all. The idea that this has gone too far, I think, it just shows how desperately we panic and, and fight back against any kind of progress. I just want to sort of finally ask you as well, I mean, again, sort of, if there is an issue that feminism is divided over right now, it is, it is the trans population um, and whose side you're on. Now, um, do you sit with um, the Jermaine Greer generation, um, you know, who say sex is sex and, you know, gender is gender and the two things are different? Um, or do you believe that your generation of feminists have to include trans women as women? I think it's very important that we include trans women and their needs in the movement. I disagree with everything Jermaine Greer said um, about trans women. 
I think that there are issues at the moment where we need to be having conversations. Again, I think for me, so much of this comes back to having open conversations. And we are so often encouraged to see this as a very polarised issue where you have to be on one side or another, when actually I think there are a huge number of extremely creative solutions um, that involve working together. Well, how do you bring the two sides another. together? Because it is polarised at the moment. I mean, you can see how much people shout at each other online and in real life. Well, I think that what we're seeing is a sense that we're told that we have to be very much um, in these kind of polarised camps. But the reality, I think, in terms of the vast majority of, of people who I've worked with in the feminist movement at the moment is that there is a huge sense of inclusivity uh, and that the importance of looking at those intersections of different women's experiences and different forms of abuse is very important. So I think and I hope that there is a huge amount of support for trans women within the feminist community. At the but where, where could you... I mean, Having said you totally reject everything Jermaine Greer says on mm -hmm. this, where could you and Jermaine Greer find common ground? I think on this issue we wouldn't. You've just got to agree to disagree? I think so, yeah. And do you, do you think she represents a significant body of opinion or is I, she out there on her own? I think that's very difficult to say. I don't know. I don't know what, where, what the statistics would be on that. I certainly don't think she's on her own. I think there's a huge amount of transphobia out there. But you don't see us as, uh, you know, in any way possible for you to to come together on that. Not on that specific issue. And I haven't searched and read every single thing that Jermaine Greer has ever said, but everything that I've seen or read that she said about trans women, I wouldn't agree with. Are you hopeful? I am hopeful. I'm hopeful in the face of everything for so many reasons, well, for 100,000 reasons, because of the women who've, who've shared their stories, who've raised, raised their voices, because of the courage of the survivors who are speaking out, um, because of the ways in which women are working together creatively across borders and boundaries, um, really against the odds, because there is so much happening. And most of all, because of the young women I speak to in schools, because of what I'm seeing happening, because of these girls who inspire me every day with the really creative ways in which they are disrupting these things, they're fighting back. This is not as it's so often portrayed in the press, a generation of, of cowering, delicate snowflakes. It's not a generation of terrified victims. It's a generation who are incredibly strong and are finding their own ways to fight back.